From Hyperloop to the TU-105, and from the World Islands to the Burj Khalifa skyscraper, let's enter the world of ambitious projects that just went a bit wrong. Discover why grand designs often fall short, from practical and safety concerns to poor planning and just financial crisis. Let's look at the dark side of mega projects, from the plumbing problems of that world's tallest building to the sinking of those islands, and you know, the possible political motivations behind their creation. Sting. In 2013, inventor and entrepreneur Elon Musk introduced the Hyperloop in a 58-page white paper that detailed a brand new fourth mode of transport. It was a bold new approach to mass long-distance travel. Or was it? Using pneumatic tubes for transport is as old as the concept of trains themselves. Pneumatics have even been used with some success, albeit not in the way you're probably imagining. In 1799, inventor George Meadows proposed pneumatic rail lines for transporting cargo meant to travel in parallel with passenger trains, using air pumps to propel pods full of mail and other sundries, eliminating the need for expensive and fuel-intensive engines that needed to stop frequently for water and coal. He even built the Brunel Jolly Sailor Runway and Pumping Station in London in 1844, equipped with a pneumatic transfer station. The pneumatic system failed to achieve mass adoption and was quietly dismantled three years later. Although that project never took off, several others did succeed in the 19th century, including the Paris Pneumatic Post, which was used to deliver mail, parcels, and even luggage around the city. It could actually even carry people, including the Duke of Buckingham, who rode it in 1865 to mark its opening. These events inspired Jules Verne to write the book Paris in the 20th century, in which he predicted the rise of feminism in the 1960s, electronic music, and tube transport dominating the modern city. Robert Heinlein would also expand on this idea in 1974 for the short story Double Star. Though Paris's pneumatic parcel service continued to operate between large hotels and railway stations into the mid-20th century, this and other systems eventually gave way to automobiles and electronic communication, such as telephones. Pneumatic mail was successful in many cities worldwide, and some of these systems are actually still in limited use today. Still, the idea of using these tubes for individual transport fell by the wayside as more economical, safe, and practical metro, bus, and tram systems came into fashion in the 20th century. Yet the idea never really went away. American rocket inventor Robert Goddard envisioned a VAC train in 1904 that could go from Boston to New York in 12 minutes, complete with passive magnetic levitation, or maglev. MIT researchers also detailed a proposal for a New York City to Boston vacuum tube tunnel in the early 1990s. Various other concept proposals have been made, including some that we'll say are um, suspiciously similar to the notorious Hyperloop white paper. The only slight problem with all of these proposals is that, well, they're all just a bit insane, really. Look, barrels of ink and hundreds of hours on YouTube have been spent debunking Hyperloop, so it should suffice for our purposes to point out the problems that have always plagued the idea of pneumatic transit on a massive scale and help explain why massive city-to-city -city VAC trains will not be a part of any near or even medium-term future. We're sorry, Elon. And just as a hint for all of the points we're about to cover, just remember regular old trains are almost always just better. First, maintaining a vacuum over a sealed tube that stretches hundreds of miles is just a practical impossibility. Even if a material could be found that could reasonably maintain such a vacuum, even under the stress of normal thermal expansion and contraction due to changes in the ambient temperature, the amount of energy needed to suck the air out of a tube of that volume would be absolutely massive. A 250-mile, 400-kilometer stretch of tubing with a radius of 1.5 meters would require thousands of pumping stations to reduce the air pressure in the tube to about 1% of one atmosphere. Even then, potentially hundreds of leaks would likely form almost immediately, necessitating that the pumps continue to work around the clock to keep the pressure low enough to achieve the speeds the system promises. The energy required to achieve the vacuum alone would be many times greater than a bog-standard high-speed train, eliminating one of the significant advantages of Hyperloop design its promised energy efficiency. Second is safety. As we mentioned, maintaining even a medium vacuum over hundreds of miles of tube would be nearly impossible. But combining that with a passenger pod barreling through at hypersonic speeds would result in an absolute death trap. 
Any potential hyperloop would be critically vulnerable to earthquakes, fires, lightning strikes, terrorist attacks, or sabotage. As the tunnel would be under a vacuum, escape hatches would be impractical and dangerous at best. And this is not even mentioning the risks of explosive decompression of the tube, which could well result in a passenger pod slamming into a section that has been crushed by the atmosphere around it, or just suddenly blow open so the cars be shot out of the tube at absolutely ludicrous speeds. Oh, and have you ever really noticed those odd little separators that appear in the hallways of really long buildings? Those are expansion joints. Even big, solid buildings are prone to moving throughout the day or through the cold and hot seasons as the building expands in the heat and contracts in the cold. This is not a huge deal for, say, a 100 meter long hallway, but it is a very, very big deal for a vacuum enclosed tube stretching hundreds of kilometers through all kinds of environments. Train systems compensate for this tendency with expansion joints along the track, which allow the rails to expand and contract while remaining in contact with each other. But achieving the same with a vacuum tube would be nigh on impossible. Without expansion joints, the Hyperloop's endpoints could move up to several hundred meters every day, meaning any stations along the system would need to somehow account for this movement. And that's before considering how such a system can maintain a vacuum at the same time. Third, are just the practical concerns. Even if all the other challenges of efficiency and safety could be solved, the practicality of such a system would be highly questionable. A typical high-speed rail system includes sidings and spurs that allow stations to be built away from the main high-speed lines and trains to be diverted or stopped without disrupting the system. A hyperloop would necessarily lack all of these practical conveniences. A stoppage or an accident anywhere on the main line would affect all traffic, potentially leaving thousands of people trapped inside a super long vacuum tube of death. Compared with run-of-the-mill high-speed trains that can already achieve speeds of above 300 miles per hour, that's 482 kilometers an hour, the silliness of the Hyperloop concept comes sharply into focus. Ultimately, the Hyperloop is an attempt to achieve a fairly practical and achievable goal, but in the least safe or practical manner possible, with few, if any, tangible benefits. A cynical commentator, who's definitely not us, might argue that the Hyperloop is a bit of a ploy by Musk. You see, Musk is a businessman who stands to benefit enormously from the failure to develop high-speed rail networks in the United States. Conspiracy theory? Maybe. Maybe not. The Hyperloop might be a dangerously stupid idea, but air travel has proven incredibly safe. To give you an idea of how safe air travel has become, in 2023, since Colgan Air Flight 3407 crashed near Buffalo, New York on February 12, 2009, killing 49 passengers and one person on the ground, there has not been a single fatality by accident of a US airline passenger in 14 years. Statistically, US air travel has become safer than walking down a public street. As we've seen, one of the absolute requirements of any cheap and accessible transport system is that it is safe. The next mega project in today's video was built with the good intentions of designers and engineers, but ended up being one of the most dangerous forms of mass transit in history. The Tupolev Tu-104, the Soviet Union's answer to the rise of American passenger jet travel. Designed to compete with the British de Havilland Comet, another airliner with its own tragic safety record, the Tu-104 was the flagship of the world's largest airline, Soviet-owned Aeroflot. In its 23 year career, it carried over 90 million passengers. It also crashed a shocking number of times. Of the 96 Tu-104s that served Aeroflot between 1958 and 1979, 16 experienced catastrophic crashes, killing 1,140 people. If you spent your career on a T-104 flight crew, you had an incredible 18% chance of experiencing a crash. That means the Tu-104 was more dangerous than even NASA's space shuttle. The plane's safety record for cargo flights was also just as bad, with 37 total airframes being lost, out of 201 being produced. So why was the Tu-104 such a ridiculously dangerous plane? 
But part of it was the design. The Tupolev was the Soviet Union's most powerful passenger jet at the time, and the hydraulic controls were heavy and physically taxing to operate. It also tended to stall at lower speeds due to a faulty wing design, which prompted pilots to try and land the plane at higher than safe speeds to maintain control, resulting in many fatal crashes. This wasn't the only complaint. The plane also had a tendency to Dutch roll, which occurs when the tail rudder wags from side to side as the plane's wings roll from side to side, causing the aircraft to crab and lose stability and control. A Dutch roll uh, can cause a plane to stall almost instantly, prompting pilots to land the Tu-104 at as much as 190 miles per hour, that's 300 kilometers per hour. The de Havilland would only stall at 74 miles an hour. That's 119 kilometers per hour. Even after the Tu-104 was withdrawn from civilian service in 1979 and everyone <laughs> let out a deep sigh of relief. It was used for official travel and null gravity training by USSR cosmonauts until a crash in 1981 which killed 50 people, including 17 senior military staff. Because when it's killing your civilians, you should have senior government people riding around a bit because, of course, Soviet Union. That makes the Tupolev T-104 one of the most useless transportation mega-projects that was ever developed. Ah, the Arabian Peninsula, where a heady mix of extreme wealth, religious fanaticism, autocratic rule, and a harsh desert environment mixes to produce some of the world's most impressive and impressively stupid mega projects. Look, we've covered the line before Saudi Arabia's ridiculous plan to build a horizontal city for some reason. <laughs> I don't know, I made a whole video about it. I was still like, why? Why are you doing this? Stop it! Today we're going to be talking about lovely Dubai, the tiny kingdom that forms part of the United Arab Emirates, a sort of United States of petro-oligarchies. Dubai has changed a lot since oil was discovered there in the 1950s. Just for a sense of how much, the country's native population was approximately 20,000 in 1950. Now, over 3 million people live there, with about 85% of these being foreign nationals, many of them guest laborers who live in shockingly deprived conditions for no more than a few dollars a day in wages. Meanwhile, sci-fi-inspired mega-projects, oftentimes personally designed by members of the royal family, dot the landscape. As a result of this, Dubai comes across as something of a funhouse mirror version of Western capitalism, futuristic, dystopian, fabulously rich, but also somehow crushingly poor. So what does a barren coastal city-state with trillions in oil wealth and an army of near slaves do with all of that money? Well, let's first turn to the Palm and World Islands, shall we? Both of the marvels of geoengineering and horrifying urban design. The Palm Jumeirah, an artificial archipelago constructed off the coast of Dubai, began construction in 2001 with an estimated budget of $12 billion. It was built by dredging sand from the surrounding seafloor, devastating the local marine habitat. 22 years later, it seems doubtful that the project's ever going to be finished or fully inhabited. What may seem impressive from the air quickly devolves into an urban planning nightmare up close. The Palm, creatively named for its shape, that of a palm leaf is centered around an eight-lane expressway, branching off into subdivisions of identical suburban homes with virtually no greenery or public space of any kind. What a dream! Despite the Palm's sparse population, it's chock-a-block with McMansion-style homes, one virtually on top of the next. The precious few residents who have bought homes on the island complain that the densely packed and monotonous subdivisions offer little privacy and even less in the way of social cohesion. Shopping, schools, and other daily necessities are mostly absent. Oh, and the islands are also sinking into the sea at about 5 mm per year, thanks to shoddy geoengineering and steady natural erosion. So. Well, that's brilliant. Most of the islands will be underwater within a century if a solution isn't found. The situation takes on a surreally ironic character when oh, one considers that Palm Jumeirah and its sister development, the Palm Jabal Ali, oh, were constructed from reclaimed land in the Persian Gulf, while similar areas of actual dry land adjacent to their construction sites are just largely undeveloped. Why these developments couldn't be constructed using canals surrounded by dry lands? just seems to be a bit of a mystery. Oh, and lest I forget, care to guess what form of public transit developers chose to serve Palm Jumeirah and Palm Jabal Ali? Just sing for a minute, and if you guess monorail, then of course you'll be correct, because 
Fate really does love irony. Dubai's mega projects tend to go horribly wrong and in hilarious fashion. The Burj Khalifa, for example, has been the tallest structure in the world since 2009 when it eclipsed Taipei 101 at 828 meters or 2,700 and some feet. But it has several drawbacks. For one thing, efforts to make it the largest building in the world sacrifice so much upper floor space in design that a set of six 12 floor high rises occupying the same footprint would offer more in the way of office and living space than the entire skyscraper. But why would you think about that when you have ego to account for? Not only that, but some wires were crossed when it came to building the Burj's plumbing systems, which were not connected with Dubai's main sewer system, necessitating the manual removal of up to seven tons of human waste per day, as well as another 15 tons of wastewater from the showers, sinks, and toilets. Today, residents of the Burj can observe a lengthy queue of poop trucks that patiently wait to fill up the wastewater of a building building that has a capacity of 35,000 people. That's a lot of sh and the hilarity doesn't end there, not even close, oh no. Trumping both the Palm Islands and the Burj is the World Islands, another artificial archipelago off the coast of Dubai, designed to act as a kind of miniature representation of the entire world, with 300 individual islands reflecting the architectural styles and history of the world's nations. It was hoped that the various islands would serve as residential developments, theme parks, and other attractions. Construction began in 2003, but was halted in 2008 due to the global financial crisis, even though 60% of the development land had already been sold off to private contractors. Today, just Lebanon Island is developed and capable of hosting corporate events and parties. In 2014, a developer responsible for the Heart of Europe Island announced that plans to build a European theme park and resort were well underway. But that was about nine years ago, and there's no visible progress, so I guess well underway was a bit of an overstatement. One wonders what the attraction might be for European tourists to fly to Dubai and attend a European-themed island. The whole thing does seem to have run out of steam, though, even as sources close to Dubai's ruling family vehemently deny reports that the entire thing is sinking into the sea. Meanwhile, Penguin Marine is attempting to back out of its $1.6 million per year lease for exclusive rights to provide transportation to and from the islands. Again, a more skeptical observer might argue that the whole thing was never much more than a way of awarding billions of dollars in development contracts to businesses friendly to Dubai's leaders and employing any of the hundreds of prominent members of the Al Qasimi family dynasty. A skeptical observer, definitely not us.